and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove. I'm your permanent host, and I'm joined by a man who'll be with us till at least November 14th, but I'm not sure beyond. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. That's, un- that's disconcerting. <laughs> it's a Dave Sarakin reference. I understand. It's, just, it's a weird, strange way to begin the show. Have I been put on notice? Well, no, sometimes the introductions are just a little joke. That's not what's actually happening. Taylor is permanent co-host. Ominous is all I'm saying. Oh, Ominous oh, start. Okay. So should we address the big the big news, weirdly? that I feel like US soccer, it is big news, but US soccer kind of... I like of- that you began with, you really, like, you were committed to big, and then you had to figure out the next word. So you went with the big news? <laughs> so, I mean, it is big news, right? Because we've all been waiting to see who will be in charge of the mm-hmm. U.S. men's national team next. And then U.S. Soccer put out this release that had sort of... It mentioned that Dave Sarakin will be coaching the team against Portugal in the headline. Mm-hmm. And then the first line mentions that. The rest of the story is about the Portugal game and where it's going to be located and what time it kicks off. And what's the phrasing? He'll, he'll be guiding Here the we men's go. national team? The actual headline is U.S. men's national team assistant coach Dave Sarakin to guide MNT in November 14th friendly yeah. versus Portugal. So I'm going to guess that was at least four people had some say in what word they used in that headline. Headline headline by committee. And I do think that it was some (laughs) debate that ended in will guide as opposed to like will shepherd, will coach, will lead. You can't have will lead in there. It's got to be will guide. And so to get to the nugget of this, Mm -hmm. we've been waiting to find out who the next head coach of the national team is. We knew it wouldn't be a permanent like big name appointment because we're going to wait at least until after the presidential Mm -hmm. election in February to do that. Maybe till after the World Cup in 2018 to do that when more big names are available. But we thought there would be a semi-permanent like official interim head coach who was fully in charge at least until the next guy came in Mm -hmm. and US soccer has kind of just flubbed it I want to say and just said we can't find anyone we're just going to put Dave Sarakin in charge well yeah so I think that leads to there being like two different schools of thought here but I want to say it it is I'll say to guide as a verb is a good choice because if you say he is the guide, the guide is the person in front showing you the way. If you are guiding someone, that means that you are escorting them along to get them to another place. Yes. And that is clearly what he is doing with this national team. He is getting them through the end of 2017. <laughs> I know. I just realized this. People may not know this. Mm-hmm. Dave Sarakin is Bruce Arena's longtime assistant. Yes. Right? He was the assistant coach through ever since Bruce Arena was reappointed mm-hmm. as U.S. men's national team coach. He was uh, Bruce Arena's assistant at – oh, actually – he was associate head coach, which is like an elevated assistant coach, essentially, at the LA Galaxy. You didn't know that, did you? you say so? <laughs> His job title was associate head coach. He was Arena's ass- assistant at DC United. Assistant to the regional manager? <laughs> Someone make that joke on yeah. Twitter already. Um, he was a head coach at Chicago Fire for a few years in Major League Soccer. But that's the extent of his head coaching. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> so, yeah, what, I mean, what's your initial reaction when you read or saw this news? Genuinely? Yeah. All right. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, it was just sort of like, oh, okay, like, yeah. sure, I guess. I don't, I don't know what this means. You don't know what I, this means. I th- well, no, I think it's because if, if we, as is the case so often with us, if we did not do this show, I would just be like, oh, okay, clearly an interim coach until they, they get mm-hmm. somebody else. But since we do this show, we talk about soccer and a lot of U.S. soccer on a daily basis. We had that expectation because U.S. Soccer had said, we're appointing an interim manager. Interim manager will be here soon. Now that it's a U.S. assistant guiding them, mm-hmm. to me, it means one and of two things. by the way, it doesn't say former assistant, now like temporary head coach or yep. anything like that. He is still weirdly an assistant coach yep. who is leading, who's, excuse me, guiding the team against Portugal on November 14th. Well, I may be wrong, but unless they resign, the coaching staff stays until the new coach comes in, yeah. and then it's up to the new coach whether or not he or she retains those individuals. I mean, that's definitely the situation. Mm-hmm. I think often like a coaching staff resigns or is fired en yeah. masse. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think th- these guys have stuck. So yeah, uh, Pat Noonan, Kenny Arena, obviously uh, Bruce Arena's son, um, Richie Williams and uh, Dave Sarakin, probably some people we don't know about are all still there. Really, the head has been cut off. Bruce Arena has been, is gone, but everything beneath him is still there. And, and here's the thing. This is why I think it's, it's, it's a bad decision on the part of U.S. soccer. Not Sarakin. I can't say I know enough about him to say one way or the other what he'll do or if he'll be good. Right. It's bad because... It doesn't really answer any questions, and it leaves more than we're already there because 
in my mind, what that means, it could mean a number of different things because it could mean that when Bruce Arena resigned, they said, like, please don't all of you quit. We have to have some sort of framework in place until we have a manager. Mm-hmm. Or it could mean that, like, U.S. soccer didn't think anything was really wrong but needed to have some sort of figurehead kind of take the blame for it. So Bruce Arena had to go, but his coaching staff, ah, oh, you guys can stick around. Can I give you a more pragmatic reason? Sure. Um, it's that, like, none of these guys are millionaires, mm-hmm. right? These guys signed contracts with U.S. soccer that went through yeah. a certain date this is their salary this is how they're sort of paying the bills from now until the end of their contract if they voluntarily voluntarily resign and there isn't another job to walk into Mm -hmm. they're kind of unemployed for a few months oh yeah yeah Yeah. so i understand why they wouldn't resign but my point is that if you're u.s soccer and you want to like make it clear this has been an unacceptable qualification campaign things are going to change waiting for Bruce Arena to resign a couple days after that game happens and then kind of being like, oh, everything else is kind of fine for now. Like, it speaks to a lack of either, like, ans- like having any sort of answers or plan, or it speaks to, well, we don't really need answers or a plan because maybe it's not that big of a problem, mm-hmm. is maybe what their approach is. And I think either way, that's troubling. Uh, yeah, I think it sends a message that they don't think some big change needs to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure how intentional that is. I, th- I actually think that maybe this is a lack of um, direction and organization problem. I see this as a failure to hire an interim head coach. The name we've been talking about Mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks now, we assumed Tab Ramos, who's the youth technical director, U20 men's team head coach, which doesn't have any games coming up, would be the ideal interim head coach because he's already in the system. And then we assumed he'd be then willing to step aside when sort of a bigger name or the final decision was made. Mm -hmm. I think something's gone wrong where they haven't been... I don't know this for sure, right? This is speculation, but I think informed speculation where they haven't been able to persuade Tab Ramos to take the interim head coaching job. They'd already lined up that friendly against Portugal Mm -hmm. and they're just thinking, well, this game's happening now. Someone's got to do it. Let's just go with the people already on staff. So to your point, I think we can't really claim to have like any... We don't claim to have any sort of inside knowledge or Mm -hmm. anything like that. But I feel like with that in mind, we can say there's like grade A speculation. Like you have like tiers of speculation. Mm-hmm. Like tier one would be sort of, yes, Tab Ramos seems to be that that candidate that they're looking at as the interim uh, for any number of different reasons. No one denied it and he was coy when he was asked yes. about it. So, so, not, yeah. so that's like, I think we can agree on that. If we agree on that, then something has to have happened. And I feel like the most logical scenario is he said, I do not want to be the interim manager. They said, well, we need an interim manager. He said, well, see my previous statement where I said I didn't want that. Yep. And they said, Okay, well, then here we are. And my guess is that they probably, when they made that announcement of we're going to have an interim manager, they thought, we'll get it all figured out. He'll take the deal. We'll give him a little bit more money. We'll persuade Tavari. And then he was like, nope, nope, nope. That is not happening. Yes. And so. And someone scheduled that Portugal friendly. And I'll also read into this. That's, um, yeah. There were two, there was originally the idea was there would be two. Yeah, I 100% believe that. And they said, look, we've scheduled one, Mm -hmm. we're expecting two. Now there's no talk of that second game. The Portugal game is being talked of as the final game of 2017. He will Um, guide them through the final game is what I think it says in there yeah. or something like that. Yeah. yeah, And so I really think this is just like, well, we've scheduled it now. Mm-hmm. We may as well go through with it. Who's on staff? Let them do it. Yeah. And it really feels like US soccer, the organization, sort of giving up on 2017 and just accepting that we stumble over the line and then we maybe start fresh. Well, I was going to say start fresh with the presidential election, but then there's the January camp to think about. There's we, we might be stumbling for a little bit longer. Well, okay, yes. And I think that's where if we go <laughs> to like microphone. tier two speculation. Yeah. I think there could either be a <laughs> colon pos- tears of frustration. <laughs> well, no, I think there's there could be a positive way to look at this, or it could be a negative. And I think the positive is that, like again, speculation that U.S. Soccer knows who they want to be the new permanent manager, and it's maybe somebody who is already coaching, or coaching a club, or coaching a national team, mm-hmm. and maybe will be coaching at the World Cup. So, say, for sake of argument, it's Yogi Lowe that they've decided. Look. Maybe he's not like realistic right now, but after the World Cup, if we throw a ton of money at him, maybe he wants a new challenge. So it's just say, for sake of argument, they've identified Yogi Lo. Okay. If they have a candidate that they absolutely want, he is number one, then maybe when you do approach Ty Ramos, you kind of can't lie to him. So you have to say, we have a candidate. That's you are definitely going to be interim but it is like an actual interim tag, not interim with an option to become the head coach. And he said, no, I don't want that. Yeah. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is they said, you're going to be the interim. Maybe you could be the head coach, but we're definitely going to like investigate our options. That's what happened to Bob Bradley, right? And he ended up yeah. coaching for five years and going to a World Cup and, and topping a World Cup group, which is like a then, historic achievement. And then getting fired with very little cause. I yes. Say, because the candidate that they had initially identified as yep. being their ideal candidate 
became available yeah, and yeah. said, fine, I'll do it. And then uh-huh. they hired Jurgen Klinsmann. And by there, we mean Sonny Galati. And yep. by him, we mean Jurgen Klinsmann. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I <laughs> think that maybe there's a chance that Tal Ramos kind of saw that situation. Yes, it ended up working out for Bob Bradley. But it just as easily could have been, Bob, you're going to be the interim manager. Oh, Jurgen, you're good to go now. Thanks, Bob. See yeah. ya. Which is kind of what it ended up being. So <laughs> I wonder if Tal Ramos maybe was holding out for more assurances or more guarantees of time or a guarantee that, like, if we get results or things look good, that maybe I'll be given more time and mm-hmm. they just weren't quite there. Is there any element where you kind of wish that Tal Ramos would uh, do just like swallow his pride in a way or not think about his career so much and just accept the interim role as a service to his country maybe? No. Or am I asking too much? I mean, no, but it's not as though we – like I can't say Tab Ramos would be a good manager. We just think he would be because he has experience with U.S. soccer, with coaching U.S. soccer, well, for me it's and as a player. For me, it's because he's been in charge of so, mu- so many of the youth mm-hmm. teams that we want – like part of my, like, my dream for the U.S. men's national team, and I think a lot of people's, is that we just like, – you know, we move on from some of the older players and bring – Bring in a bunch of the young players yeah. that we're all excited about, right? Oh. Tyler Adams, Weston McKenney, etc. Okay. And so Tab Ramos seemed like the perfect guy because he already knows those young kids and he's already worked with them to make that transition for them into the senior men's national team. So what I'm hearing from you, I'm going to back you into a corner where you have to say yes. So you want a former U.S. national team player? Uh, not necessarily. Who but, has yeah. experience with Major League Soccer. I'm not saying anything. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I said I want Tab Ramos because he's been coaching the youth teams and he's the technical director and that would make the transition easy. I'm getting there. He's played for the U.S. national team, has experience with Major League Soccer, has coached U.S. youth national teams. That would be ideal. And has experience with the senior national team. So what you want is Richie Williams. <laughs> well, he's already <laughs> there. Yeah. Richie Williams is already there. <laughs> he is. So he's, we'll part of the, he's part of the sort of walking dead staff that are <laughs> <laughs> currently in charge of the U.S. <laughs> national team. <laughs> um, so I, I, I guess so. Like I basically, I don't really, I don't really have that like hard of an opinion about like, Tab Ramos should sacrifice or should do this because I don't Fair even enough. know if it would be a sacrifice. It's just sort of like no. I mean, it would have been cool to see him, but I, I don't even know if he would have been. There's a decent like there is a chance that Tab Ramos became interim manager and then it was like good news. I'm calling up Graham Zusi to play right back and Chris <laughs> Wondolowski is definitely in that roster too, and everybody would be just as frustrated now as they are or then as they are now. It's also possible that Tab Ramos is like. Hey, I'm youth technical directing. Mm-hmm. Like I take this very seriously. It's more important for me to keep doing this mm-hmm. and you know keep that train on the tracks and try and accelerate it um, than it is for me to go and coach a friendly against Portugal. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. So and there is that. There's that argument as well. Maybe. There is that. But if I were to try to like because the Serikin appointment, <laughs> I don't even know what it is. Like. I semi appointment is what mm-hmm. I'm going to go with. With that in mind, like it's not really worth I feel like speculating what he is going to do. We can do that in a little bit, but it's not re- like we can't really. We can say what we hope he does, but I feel like it's more worth trying to establish a narrative of like what we think is maybe the situation right now. Yeah. And I think based on what we've talked about, based on what we've read and kind of expected, I think the most logical scenario is that Tab Ramos was offered the interim gig, didn't want the interim tag, or wanted assurances he would could yeah. be considered as the potential permanent manager. U.S. Soccer said no, or he didn't agree to their terms, and so that fell through. Yeah. They knew they needed somebody for this one November friendly. They appointed Dave Sarakin. And then in and January, we we'll figure something out. If, I think that's it. In January, we'll figure something out. Yeah. That doesn't fill me with confidence, it by the not. way, because there's, there's still a long way between now mm-hmm. and the sort of dream appointment of post-World Cup 2018. Can we talk about Dave Sarikin I was going to say, because that second. takes us to tier three of speculation, which yeah. is then, with Dave Sarikin being there in November, what do we think could potentially maybe possibly happen? Okay, well, here's, here's what I want to happen. Yeah. Here's the optimistic version, right? Mm-hmm. So I've been talking about how I want these youth players, you know, younger U.S. men's national team potential players, to be fine finally called into the senior men's national team and let's get them on the field together let's give it a go mm-hmm. with a sprinkling of seniors mm-hmm. not not seniors like um, over 60 but like um, players with experience right um, I think if you've got Dave Sarakin who is clearly been told like he doesn't have a shot at the main job mm-hmm. I don't think right because he hasn't even been named interim coach he's just you're in charge because we couldn't find anyone else and he's, and he's what been, has he ever been a head coach I think Chicago Fire there it is cool um, so I think there's there's an argument that I get him and Kenny Arena confused if you got someone who was like interim head coach and was auditioning for the job then mm-hmm. they'll be thinking I need to win this Portugal game then thinking I need to call up some experienced players to win the Portugal game. Mm-hmm. Then we end up with a very similar squad to the team that went through the hex, mm-hmm. right? With maybe with Dave Sarikin thinking, okay, this is just a one-off. What can I do to like be of service to the US soccer program in the short term? Maybe I do call up Tyler Adams and Brandon Vincent and a bunch of exciting young players and just give that a go and maybe lift the spirits of mm-hmm. a soccer nation that's been sort of beaten up over the last couple of weeks. 
And to that, I'm going to say, L3 fran- fans, please, I apologize in advance, but I'm going to say, I, want, I do wonder if Dave Sarakin maybe looks at Tuca Ferretti and thinks, like, that could be me, though. Like, I could come in and play these, manage these two games, and everybody could be like, hey, this guy, he's well, got some stuff figured Ferretti out. He had a different track record. <laughs> that's what I'm yeah. saying. I, that's where I say, L3 fans, please don't hurt me. Yeah. But I, I do wonder, though, if there is the flip side of that of Dave Sarakin being like, but if I take this U.S. team who struggled away to Portugal and we get a win... Maybe suddenly people are like, hey, this guy, he's got some ideas. And so maybe then it is less experimentation, more here are the players that I know but, can get the result because so those are the ones I'm familiar with. My tier three speculation is based on the idea that Dave Sarakin either doesn't have ambitions to be U.S. men's national team head coach, right? Not everybody wants to sit the Iron Throne. You know what I'm saying? I, I think, I'm, yeah, but I think most coaches do. Like he's more Varys than he is um, Littlefinger. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But, but again, isn't that what you kind of hope is the case? Yeah, but based on his track record of not mm. being head coach of teams. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he's a career assistant coach that yeah. maybe then he's more comfortable with the idea of uh, being a very temporary placeholder mm. coach before the actual interim head coach or permanent head coach comes in. And that what my argument is that maybe that frees him up to not have to try and win games to just like, you know, blood some youngsters. Because that is surely that is what people want to see. Right. Uh, I mean, I think I'm, so- I'm hoping U.S. soccer can read the mood of the fans, which is that we want to see some young players called up. Yeah, but I mean, I think also a lot of fans want to win. They want to see the United States go to Portugal and play good soccer and get a result and show that they belong mm-hmm. and show that it was just a one off or whatever. Like, I think it's tough to really sort of navigate the feelings of fans sometimes. And so basically, I think in the end, we may get kind of just a hybrid approach. Like maybe yeah. we'll get one or two young players who I, my guess would be if we do get some young players, it is not because uh, Dave Sarakin said, these are the people I want. It's going to be, hey, Jonathan Gonzalez said, if you call me right now, I'll come play. You're calling him. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, there's a yeah. chance that it's important in that way mm. to pull certain dual national players yep. into their program now. One of the, one of the points Wait, I made. Oh, sorry. Sorry. What? Really quickly, though. But that leads me to another level of speculation, which is maybe there's also a chance that Tab Ramos was told, you don't necessarily have control of who you're going to be calling in for that November game. That, yeah, that's and maybe they possible. said, we want you to call on this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And he said, I will not agree to that. And here we are. Because I could see that of U.S. soccer saying, look, we got to get people excited. You're going to call in Weston McKinney. You're going to call in Jonathan Gonzalez. Tab Ramos said, well, that's not really who I have in my plans. Mm-hmm. And then you have the situation as it is. Can I get, that's, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Can I give you two final bits of speculation? Sure. Speculation number one. Um, that needs to be in the title somewhere, by the way. <laughs> Richie, Richie Williams yep. is still on staff, as I understand it. He's one of Bruce Arena's assistants. <sighs> yeah. As we understand it, one of the reasons that Weston McKinney was not involved in some of the U.S. youth teams is mm-hmm. because uh, Weston McKinney and Richie Williams did not see eye to eye or Richie Williams didn't rate him in some way. We don't know the full story. We've only sort of basically heard rumors of, of what happened, right? Richie Williams is pretty short, though, so it's tough for him to see eye to eye with those people. <laughs> but I'm saying there's a chance that that, that harms the chances of Weston McKinney being called yeah. up. I would be frustrated if that happens. If the the uh, the coaching staff that was left in place caused a player who obviously deserves a call up, um, who's playing in a top flight European league, and the game is not that far away, it's in Portugal. If he doesn't get the call up because of that, that's going to be super frustrating. Okay, so put a pin in that because we don't know that's mm-hmm. going to happen. That's a thing we'll know when we see the roster, right? Yep. Um, number two, the optimistic part of me thinks. Bruce Arena famously had that quote about how, you know, we sort of we knew the roster needed refreshing, but we went with the experienced guys to get us through the hex. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that was a mistake. It didn't work out. But it very strongly suggests that there was a plan in place to post World Cup qualification, mm-hmm. then start pulling in some younger players. So what I'm hoping is that maybe Dave Sarakin and the rest of the coaching staff have a list of the guys that were going to be brought in for this November friendly anyway. Like mm-hmm. the, Basically, the Bruce Arena plan had we qualify for the World Cup, and that would include Tyler Adams, Weston McKenney, all those guys we're excited about. And maybe they just follow through on that blueprint anyway, and therefore we get young players caught up. I mean, and that would be, would be in keeping with the idea of like, eh, things aren't that bad, some results didn't go our way, so now I'll go to the World Cup, but we don't need to blow it up. Yeah, yeah just stick with those notes. Let's just go with Bruce's plan. Yeah. Kenny, can you, can, teach, you, can, Kenny you, can you call him and just double-check yeah. that was the plan? Can you teach his lesson plan from his notes? He's not here, yes. but you can probably wing it, right? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Kenny Arena's like, you can still call me Mr. Arena. There we go. That works. Um, <laughs> they don't even have to change the name on the door of the classroom. He has to add elbow patches? Sort of sew those on real fast? Uh, I'll say this, the fi- final thing I have to say about this friendly yeah. is that I know it was scheduled like before the United States were eliminated, so it was with the idea of like we're going to It wasn't play. announced. It was at least negotiated. It, it was, yeah, yeah, it was in the process, which means that they were kind of looking at that as a way to start getting experience playing against World Cup opposition mm-hmm. in Europe. I do think, though, it ends up being a very 
like intelligent thing to have done or friendly to have organized because I do also think that there's a chance that some young players are like, wait, I can play against Cristiano Ronaldo? <laughs> Done. Like I, think, like, I do think that Wait, that would maybe make some okay, people this interested. A, you mean do- dual nationals? I mean, or, or just... Because you, it, you know, no one's no- turning down that November friendly call. If you're a young player and it's your chance to get an in with the U.S. national team, just because the U.S. like didn't get to the World Cup, mm-hmm. young players are not going to be like, nah, not this month, I'm busy. Everyone's going to answer the call up and be like, yeah, I'm going to be part of the next generation of U.S. players. I, I genuinely don't know if I Get agree. out of here. I'll tell you why. Because you've just established Weston McKinney doesn't like, or it seems like he doesn't get along with Richie Williams. Yeah. If you're Weston McKinney, why would you go play one game that's a friendly in the middle of your season when you could just stay home and rest for a team that is going to be coached desperate by— desperate to play for the U.S. national team. Under a series of coaches who will not be there in a couple months. Like, it, it, it is— it, isn't really that worth it, I would argue. I really would argue that. that I like, disagree completely. That's fine. But I would, I would say there are— okay. I'll bet you $1,000. There's no player turns down a call-up for this. No young player turns down a call-up for there this friendly. There it is. Friendly. I feel like, see, you either, because, yeah, I think yeah, that well, there are players Yeah, because I'm saying like, maybe Michael Bradley or Josie Altidore could if they're in the playoffs or with Fabian Toronto. Johnson. Right, yeah, maybe. But no up-and-coming youngster is going to be like, nah, not this month, US soccer. Everyone's desperate to start their international career. I don't know. I mean, I mean that's true, but I also, yeah, do think that then you've got the dual national element of there probably are some players. Yeah, that's like, different. Ooh, I don't really want to wait in there quite. Yeah, yet. Jonathan Gonzalez is a different mm-hmm. case if he is on the fence, which we, as as we understand, he's not really right. Mm-hmm. He said U.S. and we've got no reason to think otherwise yeah. until something until we see a bad headline. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> okay, so more on this friendly as it gets closer, including. I mean, the big thing will be Sarakin's roster announcement. Mm-hmm. We'll have a really good read on what's happening when we see that. Oh, I think my honestly, head, my head just hurt. Darryl. That's going to determine how excited I am for that game or not can you imagine like four months ago that this was the thing that no, we were excited I about like, absolutely can you cannot. imagine saying that like just fast forward really fast or like rewind really fast and just imagine like being here for half a second and hearing you say so we'll wait and see what Dave Sarakin's roster announcement is going to be for that November friendly after the United States has been eliminated she's like well, wait what? <laughs> what what has happened can we try again <laughs> where's the butterfly that's flapping his wings that shouldn't be flapping his wings anymore and how do I stop it <laughs> how do I crush it yeah <laughs> okay so um, we've got lots of listener questions uh, yep. to answer on today's show but first today's show is sponsored by the fine and beautiful people at SeatGeek um, the fine and beautiful people at SeatGeek have created an app that makes buying tickets to sports and concerts less complicated than it's ever been it's a better simpler way to buy just two taps on your phone you can buy or sell tickets to any live sporting or other entertainment events well speaking of other, other entertainment events I looked up who is coming to Richmond lots of good concerts and musicians coming are we staying away various from soccer venues. today is that what's we are but we're <laughs> staying away from music as well because I saw that John Mulaney is coming to Richmond Virginia yeah. Is. And I would very happily see John Mulaney. I would say many times over because I've listened to most of his or both of his stand-up specials or yep. all three of them, three of them, many, many times. And we're both huge fans of his. Um, I think a lot of people don't know this, but the Stefan stuff with Bill Hader yep. on um, SNL. I just did the hands. Um, you did. <laughs> was written by John Mulaney yep. and sort of they used to kind of play with each other, right? In terms of just like. Uh, John Mulaney trying to make it, it was Bill mostly Hader John cracker. Mulaney yeah trying, yeah trying to break Bill Hader <laughs> yes and then uh, Oh Hello with uh, Gil Faisal and George St. Yes. Giglin I've heard that's really yeah. really good I've heard oh, that hello. oh yeah um, okay so John Mulaney's a perfect example I'll guarantee it's sold out mm-hmm. um, but just because it's sold out that me- doesn't mean that people won't be selling it I've gone for a lot of double negatives here mm-hmm. it may be sold out but people will be selling their tickets that's my, um, my Achilles heel via SeatGeek that's why I switched to the positive thanks for that uh, I appreciate yeah. it so if we decide we want to go see John Mulaney mm-hmm. I'll be looking on SeatGeek to see if any tickets are available they will be what else, what else is going on did you find anything else no okay I looked around I found uh, Bob Dylan mm-hmm. coming through town he's going to be playing in Richmond at the Coliseum in uh, November notoriously wonderful live shows Bob Dylan exactly so I'm in a weird spot with Bob Dylan where I'm always like I'm a big fan mm-hmm. I really I really love uh, his music but every time I see footage of especially recent live shows and by recent I mean the last 20 years mm-hmm. I'm kind of like uh, I don't know if I could do that so I'm going to have this this uh, this time in November where I'm tempted on SeatGeek to think well I've never seen Bob Dylan that would be like a thing to literally check off my bucket list like oh I saw Bob Dylan mm-hmm. but maybe not so I'll be tempted around the time I'll be checking SeatGeek I might not be buying that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but at least you can uh, use it to see if tickets are available. Yeah. And if so, then you can uh, have further guilt slash stress as to making that decision. Especially if I can think that I might get $20 off. Oh, how can you do that, Daryl Grove? Best of all, you get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase by downloading the SeatGeek app, 
click the settings tab, enter the promo code TSS, three letters for Total Sock Show, TSS. You get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. It will make the tickets cheaper. It won't make Bob Dylan's voice any better. It's not just the voice. From what I understand, it's like he doesn't face the audience, and he kind of does what he wants to do. Yeah, this is true. This is true. So, yeah, enjoy That's that concert. part of his charm, question mark? Sure. Thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring today's Total Soccer Show. Indeed. Thank you, SeatGeek. <laughs> Should we move on to listener questions? We um, shall. Can I first say that, like, five minutes ago, that was a Jurassic Park reference for me, not a butterfly effect re- reference for me, and now we can move on. All right, okay. <laughs> I'm glad that you managed to clear that. I felt the need. Because <laughs> Ashton Kutcher, no thank you. <laughs> he was probably really excited, and then he's now crushed. <laughs> he crushed him like we should have crushed that damn butterfly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so first question um, comes from Mark Floyd. Mark Floyd's question is, do the senior players of the World Cup disqualifying team owe us, the fans, an apology? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because it's not going to be enough. Like I, I think what, the best way I can explain this is, if I took you, we're on the ninth floor of our building. If I took your laptop and threw it out the window and then was like, oh, sorry, man. Like, that's not going to get the job done. <laughs> You're still going to be pretty mad. <laughs> I would say I would at least expect it. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and so I think you might expect it, but I, I think still it's not going to do enough. And I think even like Josie Altador issued his apology and I read it and my first thought was like, that's it? Like, it was sort of like, oh, we're really sorry we didn't qualify. We're sad that you guys supported us, but we couldn't do it for you. But we'll get stronger, we'll get better. And it just immediately moved on to, like, what we're going to do in the future. And for me, it's sort of like, that's great, but it doesn't make me feel any better. Just if fix my laptop. No, and so I think what I would say is we shouldn't expect an apology, but we should expect players to know that it changes things. And that, yeah, like, I, and I've said this before, that if I sell Josie Altador at a restaurant, I probably wouldn't be as inclined to be like, hey, man, you're amazing. I might be like, hey... It sucks we're not at the World Cup. <laughs> like, and, they, like, and that is what you get. In England, If England, when England failed to qualify for the Euros, you know the players heard about it and didn't want to go out in public because it was such a high-pressure situation. Yeah. You didn't have them saying, like, going to Instagram to be like, we're gutted and hopefully we'll move on and be stronger together. It's sort of like you have that expectation that people are going to be upset. I would say that um, you can't necessarily demand an apology. Yeah. But it's nice if you get one. And I, I for one, really appreciated Josie Altador's um, apology. I think, I'm not sure how he did it. I think it was like typed up in maybe notes and then posted to Facebook so it could be longer. It was basically a long Facebook post. Instagram, I think. It was more like a statement, Mm -hmm. right? But he really was like, the first line of it was a full and sincere apology to the fans. Like, you supported us and we appreciate it and we've let you down. I can't remember the exact language. That's pretty much it. Yeah, but it it was the correct tone, I feel like. And then it moved to sort of, yeah, but we're going to move on and try and get stronger. I see. I I, I really do. I disagree with you. That like, that was two sentences in a three paragraph apology and the next ones were all about like but you're fans and you're amazing and you guys are great and you pick us up and yeah. you're wonderful and I can't wait to see well, you guys and we'll be better so, and stronger and it's just sort of like yeah I don't need you to pick me up right now that's not your job your I job is to qualify it's at least a nice gesture to try right but it's, it can never repair the fact they didn't get to the World Cup but it's a nice gesture that they tried if they'd just been like yeah we don't care then that's very different I mean maybe but I, I, honestly I don't take that opinion that I, I think it's more so like it doesn't it really doesn't do anything to me I, I'm I am still so frustrated by by the fact that you said apology is not enough to get us to the World Cup yeah exactly I mean it's not going to change things and it's like that's great that you issued a public apology but it's still I'm still really mad and things don't seem to be changing and there's lots of stuff that makes me concerned now and so it sort of is like it I, just sort of is a thing that's there but it doesn't make me feel any better okay that's fair enough um, I would also argue that you could, you should I think have some sympathy for the players this is in definitely this true. moment mm-hmm. because we wanted to watch them play in the World Cup mm-hmm. they wanted to go and play in a World Cup I mean Cup. It, it's, it's cost them millions of dollars if nothing else but yeah. no it's, I, just as a, like your mm-hmm. career like it's an absolute dream to go and play in the World mm-hmm. Cup it's like the pinnacle of your sporting achievement yep. and like the fact that they didn't get there I guarantee all those players were absolutely heartbroken mm-hmm. I bet it for Josie Altador to type here's the thing for Josie Altador to type out that apology mm-hmm. I'll bet was really really hard for him right so it's You've got to have some sympathy for what the players go through after um, a really traumatic event like that. Yeah, 100%, which, again, is why I'm saying I don't think they owe us an apology. I'm not going to go around in circles with you on this. No, but I'm I'm saying that I understand that they're completely gutted and they're in the locker room and they're really upset. 
Totally understand that. Totally understand not wanting to talk to the press, not wanting to talk to fans because it's a really hard situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that's why they don't owe us an, owe us an apology, but they should expect that there is going to be stuff like Atlanta where they put up the biggest losers. Yeah. Like, you're going to kind of have to deal with that now yep. because that's the way things are. And I, I've got to say, I kind of like, I think I mentioned this on the weekend review, mm -hmm. I liked the idea of Josie Altidore fighting back against that. Like yeah. when he scored, like he cupped his hands to the Atlanta yeah. fans. Like, and I, think oh, I like seeing some fights. That's, that's always better than an know. apology. That's, that's exactly what I mean, <laughs> is that like what I don't want to see is him be like, I don't know what else you guys want from me i apologize you shouldn't be putting that banner up it's yeah. like no that's not how this works you've got to prove that that banner shouldn't I be mean, there and that's what he did i wouldn't have put that banner up but <laughs> all right next question mm -hmm. um oh so we're just talking about josie now we're going yeah. to talk about michael next question comes from ethan fletcher mm -hmm. um ethan says i've been a michael bradley apologist for a while but after the recent world cup disqualification <laughs> that's the second use of that term it really questions. is um i've begun to rethink that do you think the U.S. should drop Michael Bradley moving forward, or do you think that he still has a role to play? And I should add that Ethan sort of followed up this question um, with a lot of sort of pros and cons of Michael Bradley that were really well thought mm -hmm. out. If we read them all out, it would take a long time. But I would say to Ethan, I, I mostly agree with the pros and cons mm -hmm. um, he wrote out. So to the question, um, should we drop Michael Bradley moving forward, or does he still have a role to play? Um, I don't think we should drop him because I think he does still have a role to play. But I don't know what that role is, and I yes, don't know how much of a role that. he has. Yep. And that is a change for me. And I want to say again, like we've we've seen a lot of people sort of after the United States failed to qualify, being like, "Do you miss Jurgen?" And like, "See, we were right about this guy, or you guys were wrong about this guy." And like, I don't think that that's as valid in my opinion. But it's more so like now that they haven't qualified, things are different, and they mm -hmm. really are. And so you have to look at things differently. And part of that is like, yes, yeah, some stuff that I was willing to overlook before with Michael Bradley, yep. I'm less willing to overlook now because things need to be different. And I think most people know we've been mostly pro Michael Bradley oh, yeah. uh, for the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Um, and not, I don't want to summarize Ethan's uh, points or steal them essentially, mm -hmm. but they they overlap with my thinking which is that sort of you see some great things from Michael Bradley right this this World Cup qualifying cycle Michael Bradley intercepted a ball in midfield dribbled a bit chipped a ball over a keeper and scored at the Azteca yeah. right that was Michael Bradley mm -hmm. against Panama in that big win it was Michael Bradley who essentially controlled the midfield on his own and allowed everybody else to attack that was Michael Bradley right but it was also Michael Bradley who sort of couldn't get tackles made, couldn't organize the team from, you know, as a captain on the field, couldn't turn it around against mm -hmm. Trinidad. And there are pros and cons. And you sort of, I think it's a time to weigh the pros and cons and see, I think we saw the limits of what he can do, right? So if his, I don't think he should be dropped, by the way, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. The role going forward should be something that's not where the whole team is built around him and relies on his talents in some way, but more, can we fit him into a system that works and compensate for the things he's not good at? Yeah. I kind With of, a partner or so. Going off of that, though, I would say, like, I kind of, would like the United States to move away from the idea of like it has to be this player in this role otherwise we can't play that system or we always have yes. Michael Bradley as a number six that's always going to be the case so it's like build around that with the idea that it will be him so yeah, it yeah. sort of is like I would like the United States to move into more of a direction for the second time of the show like the way Yogi Lowe kind of has it with Germany where it's like we can call in a bunch of different players and do a bunch of different things it doesn't have to be but no matter what Thomas Muller is playing here mm -hmm. it can be like well we're going to try that we're going to move that guy there we're going to do this and yeah sometimes Muller is the false nine sometimes yeah. he's underneath a striker mm -hmm. sometimes he's a winger you know there's a lot yeah. of uh, Thomas Muller moving around he's obviously a very different player yeah to Michael Bradley. No, pretty much the exact same. <laughs> and just to give a quick opinion on Michael Bradley, he used to be a guy that could be the number eight, charge around mm -hmm. and be aggressive and win the ball back and do smart things with it. Now he's evolved into this kind of like number six. And this is Ethan's point. He's a number six who doesn't really defend that well in terms of like big tackles. And that to me, that's the missing element in his game. The reason you can't rely on him, rely on him in that way. Mm -hmm. So to answer the original question, no, we should not get rid of him because what sort of pro successful program gets rid of their good players before they're ready to be got rid of? None, I don't think. It's like, uh, unsuccessful ones? Yeah, Is unsuccessful ones. Yeah. So don't get rid of him just to like have some sort of weird vengeance for not qualifying for the 2018 World Cup, mm -mm. right? But also... Don't make him the central point and rely on him completely going forward. The thing we should have learned is that he can be part of the team, but he doesn't have to be the whole team. Agreed. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that answers the Michael Bradley question, at least for now. We have more questions that kind of relate to Michael Bradley, yep. because Michael Hastings Black asks, when national teams fail to make the World Cup, most managers will resign. Do captains give up the armband? Is this a common practice? Why or why not? Um, sometimes it coincides, right? A manager resigns and then the captaincy of the, the next manager's team mm -hmm. is up in the air while we're waiting 
uh, to see who the next manager is yeah. and who he appoints as captain. So sometimes that stuff coincides and the captain doesn't have to make an announcement of I'm stepping down, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes it happens because a captain is coming towards the end of his lifespan, not lifespan, excuse me, career span. <laughs> this isn't like Logan's run. Um, yeah. Coming to the end of his career and like it was, like, I'm going to go to this World Cup. That's going to be the, you know, the end point uh, on my career. They don't qualify for the World Cup, so the captain retires, right? Mm-hmm. So then he doesn't have to say I'm resigning the captaincy. He just retires from soccer or from mm-hmm. international soccer. So I would say it's not not common practice for an active player to say I resign the captaincy but keep playing Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no that's definitely the case it's basically you're the captain named by the manager yeah so when there's a new manager which there will be under Sarakin he'll name a new captain or he'll name Michael Bradley captain my guess is that he'll name Michael Bradley captain right Uh, when the next manager comes along well Sarakin may not because Michael Bradley may be still involved in the playoffs and Mm -hmm. therefore Bradley and Altador Almost Sarakin will get to dodge that question because they won't be available for that Portugal game. Or they will be available, but they'll probably, Toronto will say, can we keep them here? We've got playoffs coming. Yes. And that, that then, okay, I think I have my answer. Then the question is, so if you're playing a friendly in Portugal in November, that doesn't really matter, uh, then you're probably going to call in a lot of European-based players. Yeah. So then who do you think is the captain Oh, no, you ask me that. Uh, I have an answer. Would you like me to go first? Jeff Cameron? That's the answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's it, right? I mean, yeah. You- but again, the other thing is, though, there's obviously some bad blood between Jeff Cameron and the coaching staff, I think, in the final couple of games. So does that stick around? Uh, I keep because, forgetting it's the same staff. Because it's the oh. same staff. Or does that get wiped clean as it might have been with a new coaching See, staff? See, uh, uh, genuinely. See, this, this friendly is more interesting than you think now. Oh, no, it's it, I never said, soap opera I never said it wasn't interesting. Yeah. But I think f- this is another example of, yeah, Jeff Cameron very well may turn down that call up and mm-hmm. be like, no, I'm kind of hurt and I need to focus on Stoke or <laughs> Stoke might say, like, oh, no, he hurt his back <laughs> and can't be cleared for international duty. Uh, so yeah. so we shall see. That's another interesting thing I had not thought about. But, yeah, yeah. nor would I expect Michael Bradley to make a public statement saying, I am no longer the captain, in the mm-hmm. same way that I wouldn't expect players to issue public apologies. Because there's also there may be a thing where the next manager comes mm-hmm. in and says, actually, can you be the captain again? Yeah. <laughs> and then he has to do an embarrassing walk yeah. back. The only one I can remember is... After a World Cup, I can't remember which World Cup, was it 2010? David Beckham resigned the England captaincy. He, didn't, maybe it was well, he, he was injured in 2010. He was on the bench but wearing a suit, so I'm guessing it was 2006. Okay, so maybe 2006 after England. Well, no, they had a decent World Cup in 2006. I can't remember. It okay. may, he was inj- I think he tore his Achilles maybe heading into the 2010 World Cup, so maybe he like resigned it permanently so somebody else could manage or be the captain of England. Okay, so the only thing I know then for sure without looking it up is there was a, a tournament that went badly and David Beckham was the captain and after the tournament he resigned the captaincy but said he wanted to stay on playing and it was seen as kind of like a chess move to be like don't kick me out of the team altogether. I want to still keep playing, but I also this is this is um, a signifier that I understand that I am no longer an immediate first choice player, and this is me sacrificing a little bit of my importance in order to try and stay around the team. I feel like the answer to this tournament question is it Euro two thousand eight. I think it's got to be Euro two thousand eight, right? <laughs> That's the obvious one: is that they failed to qualify, and thus he was oh, like, you maybe. know what? I'll resign the captaincy. Yeah. Somebody else can somebody, shepherd this team. Somebody guide this team. Somebody yes. has tweeted this at us already. I'm sorry. Mm. I'll look this up and figure it out. I'll put yes. it in the show notes. The correct answer will be in the show notes. All right. Well, how about we just transition on then to the next question from <laughs> yes, Adam please. Ulrich. He says, what impact will the UEFA and CONCACAF Nations Leagues have on the USMNT over the next four to five years? I was hoping the US would play more games against South American teams, but that seems unlikely with so many CONCACAF games. Okay, so here's what's happening. Yep. UEFA Nations League yep. is definitely happening starting September 2018. CONCACAF Nations League is not definitely happening. It's just been suggested. Yes. Okay, so a lot of people will have the question, what's the UEFA Nations League? Yeah, we've actually had that question emailed to us several, several times. So this is, you know, going out to all those people who emailed it to us. Is several, several many? When you get multiple severals, does it become many? I don't know the answer to that. I think yes. Let's let's say yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one of the reasons for the UEFA Nations League is there were several, several friendlies (laughs) that a lot of (laughs) national teams we're not thrilled about playing, right? Yep. These were friendlies with no points on the line, and it got it's it was start it's been starting to get that feeling of why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Except that there's an international date, and we all have to play international soccer, right? When there's no qualifiers going on and no like World Cup warm up type stuff going on. Okay, mm-hmm. so UEFA came up with this plan, which I actually I really like, and it's kind of, I think I'm not in the majority here to replace friendlies with a thing called the UEFA Nations League, where all the teams in, all the national teams in UEFA have been. Um, 
tiered out. I think there are three or four different tiers, like the best teams in the first tier, the, the mm-hmm. weakest teams like San Marino in the bottom tier. And then within those tiers, there are groups of three or four teams. And essentially, they play like a little uh, group stage over the course of the, the international dates instead of the friendlies where points mm-hmm. are at stake in a table and there'll be a champion at the end of it. So you can be the UEFA Nations League Tier 1 yeah. champion. And I think relegation promotion too, right? Yes. Or, yeah, <laughs> you always say relegation promotion, right? I say mm-hmm. promotion relegation. This yeah. is like a goalkeeper at the top of the page or the bottom of the page situation. I mean, you've got to make space for other people to be promoted into it, right? You can't just <laughs> promote true. somebody to a spot. you got to get rid of somebody or create a new spot. But, yeah, so if you finish in mm-hmm. the bottom of your group in the Tier 1 uh uh, tournament uh, the bottom of the various groups mm-hmm. you get relegated down top of the tier 2 groups they go up so there is something to play for for everybody you're going to avoid relegation yep. or you're going to be going for promotion and it means that all these things that were formerly just uh, international friendlies where you go through the motions mm-hmm. now there's points on the line and it should add some sort of vim and vigor to the proceedings so two things there number one you've made me question my outlook on life because now I'm wondering like I think of myself as a cheery person but if I begin it with relegation promotion <laughs> does it mean that I'm like that, like something must be defeated before something can succeed <laughs> (laughs) That's not good. Number two, I want to give you uh, praise because you avoided making a Daryl Grove joke there. Because I was ready for you to be like, didn't occur to me. Well, (laughs) probably. But I was ready for like it's the like the top tier teams like Germany and France and Spain, and then the bottom tier teams like Scotland. Like I was ready for you to make a uh, a home nations joke, but you didn't. So well done. I mean, Scotland. We're feeling Scotland's pain right now with the lack of World Cup qualification. This is true. We're going to establish our own. I've realized. I've realized now it's not funny. Nit tournament. That's what we're going to do. So you've done a good job of explaining the UEFA. Uh, yes. Nations League. But so then, what is happening with CONCACAF, Dale Grove? So all I'd seen is, uh, I can't remember who the quote was from. Was it from the CONCACAF president? Yes. Okay, so suggesting, uh, Montaliani, so suggesting so. this is a thing that they're looking at doing something very similar um, for CONCACAF, where you would tear things out, and then the, the top teams, which would be U.S., still just about the U.S., mm-hmm. um, Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Honduras, would like play each other at the top of this division uh, to have some, f- like not friendlies, but uh, points on the line, but not a qualification thing. Right, because I think part of it was, because we've talked about this before, because there was this, and then there was the changes to how World Cup qualification will yes. work, now that there's going to be more teams. Mm-hmm. And when you have those changes in place, it means you won't have the hex anymore. Yep. So I think the idea then was is that like with CONCACAF, you would still have the hex in the form of the CONCACAF Nations League where you'd still have your best teams yeah. all competing against each other so you create competition that way. Mm-hmm. But then World Cup qualif- qualification is designed so that you keep some of the smaller nations around for longer. Yeah, so they're not eliminated from the World Cup like yeah. two years before mm-hmm. it starts. Yeah, like uh, Antigua and Barbuda, yeah. for example. But I feel like that's worth clarifying because I feel like all the wise people are going to be like, wait, so you have the hex in World Cup qualifying and then you also have the hex yeah. in the Nations League? That's and odd. W- worth saying that for all the... There's obviously been a lot of trouble at CONCACAF ever since the FIFA sort of mm-hmm. stuff, the scandals happened and all the corruption um, no firm decisions have been made yet so we don't know what post World Cup 2018 CONCACAF looks like so there could be like no more hex and like a different qualification process there also as well as that could be a CONCACAF Nations League Mm -hmm. I want to say I'm in favour of the Nations League because if you think of it this way We've been so long talking about how the U.S. needs to go and play against European teams and, like, you know, make our bones against these teams. Those teams are going to be busy now with the UEFA Nations League. Mm-hmm. Having the UEFA Nations League means less um, international dates available for the U.S. to play against European teams in friendlies. Second point, which is important, is we just fail to qualify out of the hex by yep. being not as good as the other CONCACAF teams, right? Mm-hmm. We were not as good as Panama or Honduras or Costa Rica or Mexico and on aggregate, we were better than Trinidad, but for one very special night, we were not. Um, yep. So maybe it's worth the U.S. visiting more regularly um, in non-World Cup ways to um, Honduras and Costa Rica and Panama and trying to sort of earn wins down there more regularly. I would also guess that there are going to be international dates in which there will still be some freedom because I think that's probably one thing that you have looked at is if we have the Nations League, we are only ever going to be playing European nations. Mm-hmm. And so I bet you're going to have some things where it's like, oh – for example, this November, if it were like two November friendly dates, they'll say like, okay, Germany are going to be playing one European opponent, and then they have like one freedom to skip, like one possibly. date freedom. I don't know that for sure, but possibly. And the other aspect of that I would say then is that if you are Germany who want to blood youngsters, if the Nations League Can is... Can stop doing that? It's getting scary. Well, we'll put it, <laughs> yeah, it is. But if you're, if you're wanting to do that and you actually care about the UEFA Nations League, which you may for any number of reasons... Then the opportunity to play these youngsters, these young up-and-comers, the ones who are in the Olympics who now want to get like a senior cap, 
you do that against non-European opposition because it won't count against you. So there is maybe yeah. that argument there. That oh, so if you've got dates, senior team plays for points, like the yeah. more experimental team plays against. Um, yeah, because uh, I. Th- because I think about the United this, States. Yeah, but I think about the times that we've played Germany in the past in friendlies, and it's either we go to Germany and play their like B B B plus team, yep. or they come here and they play their B minus C plus team. Yeah, yeah. And so like I feel like that could still be the case that we might get the German young team come yep. here to play one friendly while they're playing somebody else. And it's also I think I think the Concacaf Nations League would be better for the US because be, because there are points on the line. Yeah. Like the thing that you don't get in Concacaf is two cycles of qualification like you do in Europe because you've got the two uh, you've got the cycle for the Euros qualification and then you've got the cycle for the World Cup qualification yep. so you always have games where points are on the line like right now because we haven't made the World Cup the US is talking about oh there are no competitive games until 2019 and then World Cup qualification doesn't start until yeah. whenever it starts so you would eliminate those gaps of meaningless games because you'd always be playing for points in the CONCACAF Nations League. But we don't know that that's definitely happening. And to bring it all the way back to your initial point, though, that like, yeah, we just failed to get out of CONCACAF. And one of the many reasons why we failed to get out of CONCACAF is because CONCACAF sucks. It's hard. It's hard. It's not fun at times. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. Not that it's like bad quality, but that yeah. it's difficult. And that like, like we always go back to the Timmy Chandler Honduras game. But if you had another game away in Honduras a year before when you're playing in the CONCACAF Nations League, yeah. that's less pressure but still kind of pressure. And you were like, oh, yeah, this is tough. I'll be better prepared when so we come saying, here in a year for the World Cup qualifiers. Yeah, more exposure to that stuff yeah. is better, right? Yeah, so we absolutely. can't go to anywhere and complain about the field. Mm-hmm. We should have played on it before and know what that field is like and have a plan for dealing with that field. Exactly, because that's a really good point that I had not thought of. Because really it is like if you go and play – like. Uh, the the ones before the 2014 World Cup where we went and played like Germany and the Netherlands yeah. and like, Bobby Wood scored goals and we were at Data Williams scored mm-hmm. goals we were all super excited you're playing Germany and the Netherlands in Europe you're playing on really nice fields beautiful stadiums whatever mm-hmm. that does not prepare you to play on whatever we played on in Trinidad or whatever <laughs> you might play on in St. Vincent or whatever so like yep. you yeah I feel like that gives you and also maybe there's that reminder of like hey you're playing great here but remember you're about to go play on a cricket pitch yep. so get used to that all right. And don't be surprised when it's uh, not as much fun. <laughs> Final question of the day comes from John Adams, not that one. Mm-hmm. Um, John has an MLS question, so we're getting away from the US Men's National what Team. What happens if one day like John Adams, the second president of the United States, does actually email us a question? I'm concerned. I mean, I'd probably answer it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so John Adams is not in a lot of like theoretical alternate <laughs> universes at this point. Why is the final day of Major League Soccer called Decision Day mm-hmm. with capital Ds. Um, it feels like I'm waiting to hear what University San Jose Earthquakes are choosing to attend on a full ride scholarship. Is this a weird name for the final day of the season or are my lenses still just tinted when looking at MLS in the aftermath of, well, you know, that recent <laughs> event? What would be a better name for Major League Soccer's final day? I submit the entry of actual Champions Day since I prefer a points winner of a full season over a tournament winner. Hmm. Yeah, except I think you could make the argument then that like you don't refer to the final day of the Premier League season as Champions Day because yeah, yeah. a lot of times the champion has already been decided. My honest answer is because we Survival have... Survival Sunday, isn't it normally called that? Because like, they're televising the relegation See, games. Actually, yeah. that kind of bleeds into my answer for why it's not uh, deadline day is because you already have deadline day. Or like why you don't... I think it's because there's so many other names already there. So like, sur- what was your Survivor... Survival Sunday. Yeah, so you already have Survivor Series for wrestling. I just feel like there's already so many other branded things out there that it has to be something. I think Decision Day is a deliberate sort of – it deliberately sounds like Deadline Day because everyone knows that Deadline Day is a thing, Transfer Deadline Day that everyone talks about. So I think they've used the similar phrasing for Decision Day to kind of get it in your head. Oh, I'm going one step further and I'm saying I think they want it to be Deadline Day, but there already is a Deadline Day. So they're like, (laughs) we got to do something else. So Decision Day, which still neither one of those really makes sense because it's not like one team is like, you know what? I'm deciding not to go to the playoffs. (laughs) Like, And there's no deadline for making the playoffs. Like it, it should be like, Above the line day or something. So, like, are you above the line? We'll find out after this day. I think, I mean, so an alternative would be... I think like um, you didn't like above the line and I'm sad about it. Above the line? No, above the line day is good because it's, yeah, yeah, dotted line day. Yeah. Dotted line yeah, day because yeah. you still get the alliteration, which mm-hmm. is part of why it's decision day is, is alliteration, true. right? Mm-hmm. Um, my alternative, dotted line day is good. I think I'm, I'm in on this. Right. Um, could also be almost as good as pro rail day. <laughs> Because that's the argument you often hear, right? Is that it was with, exciting. With, wait, wait, with the question marks? With the involved. question mark, okay, cool. yeah. And the actual text, you'd have to, you can't do this in Microsoft Word, you'd have to do it in Photoshop. Oh the, text would, the text would bend upwards at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I just, listeners, I cannot convey to you the seriousness with, with which Daryl Grove just said, with a question mark, like as though it were the most obvious thing in the world. 
<laughs> I'm standing there. So I was saying you often hear this argument that, you know, the uh, the drama of the final day of the season when you either make the playoffs or you don't. Yeah. People say that's as exciting as promotion relegation um, in other leagues. Mm. I'm not quite sure that it is, but that's obviously what it's meant to be sort of going for, right? So almost as good as pro rel day yeah. is, is one possible alternative. And, and Dotted line day is the winner, though, um, I think. And the cynic in me would also just add that it's also fine to not have a name for it day. Oh. Because when you get to that moment where, like, and the Premier League has this too, even with relegation promotion, when like you get to that point on the final day where it's like, well, top three is decided, the relegated teams are relegated, but who's going to win the battle for fourth? Like You've mm-hmm. got to try to really build the drama. Yeah. MLS has those moments too where it's like, well, the playoffs are more or less decided, but who's going to play third versus fifth? So this gets to a really interesting point. Mm-hmm. Um, when I called it Survival Sunday, yeah. or whatever I called it, the Premier League isn't doing that, right? Mm-mm. It's Sky Sports or BT Sports this is doing that. The media companies do that because they take the product and they market it for the Premier League. Mm-hmm. In Major League Soccer's case, because it's a different economy where you're struggling for attention, right? You're trying to get as much attention as possible. I, The real answer to John's question, the reason it's called Decision Day, is a branding exercise mm-hmm. to try and make it a thing so that you can sort of build some momentum around it. Mm-hmm. Because it was Decision Day brought to you by AT&T. That's true. That's a, that's actually what it was called when you see the full uh, the full name on the uh, on the broadcast and on the MLS website. So it's so you wow. name it something so you can then brand it something. You can't sell something until you brand it. We get we gotta we gotta get on board with this. I mean, we're sponsored by SeatGeek today. It's the well, I just mean more so like it's the AT and T transition into scouting report segment. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, will we get there in time? So Find like, out using AT and T. Micro sponsors for every tiny thing in I the mean, show. I mean, that's I'm thinking yes. <laughs> I want, I just want MLS to like to really like continue pursuing this. Like, it's mid season report day, brought to you by Sprint. <laughs> Even though Sprint doesn't exist anymore, midterms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michelin tie midterm report. There you go. There we go. You're uh, getting good at this. Yeah, Got exactly. a line day. Continental tires would be very upset with that. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am available for branding consultations. I'm <laughs> only I'm only half joking. Dotted line day doesn't just come to people. <laughs> that takes a certain level of branding genius, my friend. <laughs> All right. So if you would like to ask a question mm-hmm. of us to answer on the show, we're going to get back to doing much more of it. We've kind of been sidetracked by what John called uh, um, that recent event yep. the last couple of weeks. Um, if you'd like to ask us, a, it, it was the US Finance Oh, I'm, I'm aware. I'm just trying to think if there is, like, could we call it, like, the recent unpleasantness and just leave it at that? Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, there needs to be something i think the recent unpleasantness yes. as we lift a very nice cup of tea yes um, if you would like to ask us a question please li- please go to totalsoccershow.com slash questions mm-hmm. there'll be a form that you can fill out and it populates a spreadsheet where we can easily pull all the questions from we're going to be answering a lot more questions this week and in the very near future um, also if you are a subscriber to the show um, you contribute uh, ten dollars a month or more which you can do at totalsoccershow.com slash join we guarantee to answer one question per month on the Total Soccer Show. So $10 a month or more, we guarantee to answer a question a month. And questions again go to totalsoccershow.com slash questions. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to support the Total Soccer Show monetarily in any level, then you will be assigned a Total Soccer Show scout. A lot of Total Soccer Show branded uh, things in there. Yeah, so see, we're getting there. (laughs) We're getting there. We're working our way up to Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) AT&T. Okay, so um, I've assigned a lot of uh, players in the Scout Network Mm -hmm. uh, recently. I've still got more to work on. I will be assigning more scouts today. The problem is is there's not any young soccer players out there anymore. (laughs) They've all been assigned. That is not true. There are many. But I did want to take this opportunity to say for those of you who have just joined the Scouting Network or for mm-hmm. anybody who needs, you know, just a little bit of like a new idea if you've been scouting for a while, Twitter is your friend. Because if you go to yes. Twitter and search your player's name, there's always either their personal Twitter account where they're doing something weird, which is always worth reporting on, <laughs> yeah. or more likely you'll find little clips, highlights here and there that will help you to better like get an understanding of what that player is doing yeah. more than just – because I know a lot of people can't watch, for example, if you've got a player playing in Sweden, yeah. like you probably aren't going to watch many Swedish games so you won't get an idea of what they're doing on the field but if you find some of those clips at least you can see like oh he likes to dribble with his left foot but shoot with his right or yeah, yeah. little moments like that and you'll see those weird niche conversations mm-hmm. that happen on Twitter and someone is talking about your player because yep. Twitter is everywhere yeah? Twitter's everywhere <laughs> and then the other one that I find particularly useful is Reddit but specifically Ooh. the comment section of Reddit because mm-hmm. if you go to like a post match thread for a game and you'll find them for all different like leagues and teams if you go to Besiktas playing Trabzonspor in the Turkish Super League and click that like match report mm-hmm. you'll see there's always going to be gifts in there and links to footage and so you can always find little moments here and there if you have a player playing can one search reddit you like, can can you search for a player's name 
in the Reddit soccer search bar and see what comes up? You can. You can limit it, and you can limit it to Reddit soccer, and then you can also, what I tend to do is search our soccer uh, for that player's name or team or whatever, and then I filter the results by new. So then yes, because then you get the, the newest news. Okay, so those, yep. these are Taylor Scouting Tips sponsored by Sprint. Do we want to do one by Sprint? Sponsored by... T-Mobile? What's, what's T-Mobile does... alliteration. Oh, I'm trying to remember all the ones that don't <laughs> exist anymore. <laughs> Altel, I think, is in there somewhere. Did Vodafone, Singular. Did Vodafone ever come over here? I, I feel like they tried to briefly, and they're like, now nah, we're good, never mind. <laughs> That's because Taylor's scouting tips weren't around. Not so uh, much. Any more scouting tips? Uh, yeah, don't use any of those, uh, those random cellular providers. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Um, one thing I would say is to find short highlights of your player. Mm-hmm. And they're always like, if you're, if you're scouting a player in La Liga or the Bundesliga or you know, any league, um, there will be like two minute highlights of the game that your player played in. It's worth just watching that because you might see something. He may be involved uh, in a goal or in conceding a goal or he might make the highlight reel. And that will be a great report that we'd love to hear about Mm -hmm. that. He also might not, right? Which is fine. He doesn't have to do something every week. He he or she does not. He or she does not. Mm -hmm. So shall we get to today's scouting reports? We shall. Starting with Tom Bice scouting Serginho Dest, 16-year-old American right back, excuse me, for Ajax. Uh, Dest had a nice low cross to Josh Sargent for the assist on the lone goal in the U.S. U-17's loss to England. And that is all that happened to Serginho Dest in that game. I don't believe that's true. <laughs> Didn't he also give away a penalty and, and get, get a straight red off? card? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so do you know. I feel like uh, Tom is just trying to see the bright side of yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe Tom should have watched the, uh, the highlight video all the way to the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave Pincus is scouting Bartosz Kapuczka, the 20-year-old Polish winger on loan at SC, excuse me, mm-hmm. Freiburg from Leicester City. Dave says, Bartosz has rarely made the match day squad for Freiburg this season and has not been caught up by Poland since November of 2016. Is that good? No. The news outlet Sport.pl reported yesterday that the Freiburg coach says that Kapuczka does not know how to defend, so things are not looking good for the Bartman. Yes. Um, for Taylor's prediction of five goals and five assists. That yeah. was your Bundesliga yeah. prediction. It's not looking good for either one of those things, Mm-mm. and I'm a little bit disappointed. Uh, Elijah Chappell scouting Joe Willick, 18-year-old English central midfielder for Arsenal. The future. Mm-hmm. Joe uh, has agree? started Glad his— you agree. Yeah, why not? I mean, I feel like you've assigned a lot of people future yeah. status, so, you know, well, I've got two. I've got two continents to cover. See, what's going to happen, though, is that you're eventually going to— One of them will break through, I'm and gonna you're going to cover my bets. Yeah. <laughs> That's not how it works. Um, Joe started That's his exactly second how it's game for work. Arsenal during their away trip to Red Star Belgrade. Oh, boy. A variety of reports after the game described his performance as good or not bad. Solid. Uh, it also sounds like Willett could leave on a loan move in January to get more senior minutes because he is getting minutes in the League Cup, but whether or not, that, whether or not that's enough to sustain him remains to be seen. All right, okay. Uh, Trent Brokaw is scouting Timothy Tillman. This was a recent assignment because Timothy Tillman is an 18-year-old German-American attacker with Bayern Munich. Mm -hmm. Um, So Trent says, Tillman came on in the 68th minute to play on the right wing for Bayern Munich 2 in their 1-0 win over 1860 Munich. Um, He's been playing in a more central position this season and has been getting minutes with the German youth national teams, but nothing is official as yet. I think also uh, Trent pointed out in there, but I left out that I think that was... Bayern Munich, Bayern Munich 2 versus 1860 Munich 1. Like their yep. senior team, which mm-hmm. has got to be kind of brutal. Yep. <laughs> if you're an 1860 fan, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Clay Jenkins scouting Jaden Sancho, 17-year-old English winger for Borussia Dortmund. I'm waiting for you to say it. Oh, he's the future. There it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sancho got Dort- his first... Dortmund's wings are the future for both my national teams. This is true. Yeah. Uh, Sancho got his first Bundesliga minutes on Saturday. He played the last six minutes in Dortmund's 2-2 draw with Eintracht Frankfurt. Uh, he showed some excellent, uh, showed some excitement with a nutmeg and a well-struck shot that was saved and seems to have cemented his spot on the bench, so maybe more minutes to come for him. Sounds like Clay either watched the game or the highlights. So mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the kind of scouting reports we were referring to in Taylor's tips. I heard he went to Twitter, found a link to Reddit, and found the highlights on Reddit. <laughs> so well done, Clay. You're joking, but that's actually a thing that I've done. Uh-huh. <laughs> Craig Turner is scouting... You're, you're, you're joking. Jerry from uh, from Parks and Rec. Yeah, <laughs> you go you go to y- Yahoo to search how do I open my Gmail or something like go. that. Yeah, <laughs> Craig Turner is scouting <laughs> Joe Gomez, twenty year old English defender for Liverpool. Craig says, given what happened with Dejan Lovren this past weekend, the recent unpleasantness, many pundits expect Matip and Gomez to be the new starting centre back pairing for Jurgen Klopp. 
Gomez has been playing fullback, but centre back is his preferred position. Mm-hmm. I like this because I want more English centre backs to be playing centre back. It's good for the future. But I remember one of the goals. Didn't Gomez and Mignolet collide? Like it was kind of Gomez's fault colliding yeah, with Mignolet. I think so. All and right. also Gomez didn't hold the. Uh... The high, the high line yeah, for the was, first goal. That was right back, Gomez. That's also, a, want to make a note Gomez. that you just said the future again. <laughs> Russell Varner scouting Hugo Ariano, 19-year-old American defender for the LA Galaxy. As ever, Ariano's future remains uncertain. <laughs> Siggy Schmidt wants to prioritize improving the defense for next season, and Ashley Cole has said he's unsure if he will be back. I'm sure that was said for everyone named Ashley Cole. That's why Ashley Cole is opposite Terminator. Correct. <laughs> I am unsure if I will be back. It's well done by you. Ariano is LA's current backup option there, which can mean more minutes for him next season. Brooks Gatzmeyer is scouting Nuhu Tolu, known as Nuhu, the Mm -hmm. 20-year-old Cameroonian left-back for Seattle Sounders. Nuhu started and played the full 90 in the Sounders' 3-0 win against the Colorado Rapids. That was the Dempsey red card game, right? Um, He has now locked down the the starting spot there, with Schmetzer repeatedly stating that the strong left side of Nuhu and Jovan Jones is a great pairing Mm -hmm. until Jovan Jones leaves for Darmstadt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's in Jordan Morris' absence, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, Jones will have moved up to left wing from left back. You got it. There we go. Justin Hansen, final report of the day, scouting Frank Kessie, 20 year old Ivorian central midfielder for AC Milan. Do we know if it's Kessie? I, we don't. We also, I think it's there's another one too. It might be like Kessie. It might be like Kessie. I forget. Justin has solved this problem for us. Yeah. 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 Justin, give us some pronunciation here. I'm assuming it's no. Frank, but is it Frank? Read the first line. Frank the Tank? There we go. We don't have to worry about the Kessie Kessie stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Frank the Tank. <laughs> well, no, but that also solves that one for me. It's Frank then. Oh, or I'm maybe assuming. it's Frank the Tank. Either way, (laughs) has started and gone the full 90 in each of AC Milan's last two matches. A crushing 3-2 Milan derby loss to Mauro Icardi. We saw that. (laughs) Um, Slash Inter Milan. And a (laughs) no-no draw at home with Genoa. Uh, Kessie Kessie, uh, also came on as a sub in a midweek Europa League no-no draw with AEK Athens. Over those matches, he registered no goals and no assists. Justin adds, quote, I apologize in advance. This report is going to be bland and uninspiring, much like AC Milan's recent performances. Currently 11th in Serie A, Milan (laughs) appeared to be two-thirds of the way to becoming Italian Everton (laughs) because they spent big in the summer, they've underachieved in the league, and now many people are calling for manager Vincenzo Montea's head. Ooh, yeah, there's a lot of pressure on him this season with how much money Milan... We talked about the big Milan rebuilding thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Do you want to talk about Koeman for a second? Because we didn't really talk about what was going to happen uh, after the 5-2 loss to Arsenal. He was fired the next morning, probably by the time most people heard Mm -hmm. our show we recorded before uh, that happened. Another another questionable one there in, like... In the vein of he will guide the men's national team. I think it was just Kuman has left the club is what I kept seeing <laughs> reported. Out. Yeah, it's just like just I, I, I kind of thought that of like he's gone for a walk. He wandered he's away. Think but about things. We didn't go after him, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we locked yep. the gate. We said that's <laughs> definitely where the new trading facility is, and then we locked it when he left. He said, "I, I, Ronald, I think there's another expensive attacking midfielder over there. Go see what you think of him. Go take a look." And Ronald was like, "Yeah, definitely. We need more of those." They sent him to the big number 10 farm in the sky. (laughs) All right. Um, One rumor I've read, I don't know, this may have changed already by the time we're recording. Mm -hmm. David Unsworth, former Everton player, and he was coach of the U23s, I believe, Mm -hmm. is going to be the interim coach Mm -hmm. in kind of a Tabramos type situation where I'd be excited because I think that would mean more of Everton's exciting young players getting more minutes in the first team, right? I'm talking about Calvert-Lewin. I'm talking about um, Lookman. I'm talking about Tom Davies. All these players would get some minutes. Well, you, and I'm kind of hesitate to bring this up because I don't want to go back to talk about the U.S. national team, but you off air had mentioned that you would have loved to see a player like Landon Donovan or maybe like a oh, name like yeah. that uh, get appointed. So what I'm hearing you say now is that you want Wayne Rooney to be player manager <laughs> of Everton. <laughs> I would love that. That would be amazing. <laughs> that would be can we, so can we talk bad. about Okay, so to close out the show, yeah. can we talk about my Landon Donovan idea, mm-hmm. which is if U.S. soccer was kind of more PR savvy, um, instead of just saying, yeah, we're going to continue on with the same coaching staff but without Bruce Arena, and I'm sure all the fans will be happy, they could have talked to someone like Landon Donovan, who's obviously well-loved, and just said, how would you like to coach the US team for one game um, and just you know, see what you can do? See, I think it's because they are PR savvy that they didn't do that. Because I think on the one hand, yeah, to your point, like doing that would be like, oh, it's fun. Everybody loves Donovan. Let's see what he can do. I'd watch that game. I mean, I'm going to watch the game anyway, but I'd be more excited to watch that game, more curious to watch that game with Donovan in charge than Dave Sarakin. But you and I, like, 
try to be optimistic about the national team. For people who are really genuinely frustrated about the way things are and angry about the way things are with U.S. soccer, having like a one-off, like, isn't it fun we made Landon Donovan the coach, would be like, (laughs) what is happening? This is terrible. I mean, I wouldn't headline the press release, isn't it fun? But I can see what you're saying. (laughs) Hooray! What a fantastic day of whimsy. (laughs) Landy cakes for everybody. (laughs) I mean, that could work. <laughs> yeah, it, it could work, right? But I'm saying, like, other national teams have done this, right? Like, Argentina appointed Diego Maradona. Mm-hmm. Um, Romania appointed Georgi Haji. Like, the only player of that caliber in terms of sort of standing within the country in the U.S. is Landon Donovan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Travis, Travis and I, I think, talked about you and I talking about this idea on the did recent do, Top Draw Soccer show. Did Top Draw Soccer show was a meta total soccer show. It was weird. Uh, and the I think what we reached, the consensus we reached, is that if Donovan were in charge, he probably wouldn't call up Clint Dempsey again, just to make sure <laughs> that they stay level on uh, level on goals. <laughs> call up Landon Donovan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like when Ryan Giggs was in charge of Man United, and it was like, maybe he calls himself up for that final day just yeah. so he can keep his appearance record alive. <laughs> Speaking of Top Draw Soccer Show, uh-huh. that will publish, what, Wednesday morning? Yep. What's the topic? I had to wait outside our office while you finished recording. You so sure did. It better be good. Yeah, you stay outside. <laughs> uh, it's basically just kind of going back over the U-17s, a couple of final points about the U.S. U-17s performance mm-hmm. at the World Cup, then looking at homegrown players, young players, development academy players in Major League Soccer, because things seem very good. It seems like lots of players getting lots of minutes, but maybe out of the surface, not quite as rosy. So we've got to delve into that as well. So we're fulfilling the original Will Parchman promise of uncovering the underbelly of American soccer. Yeah, I think, I think so. HGP and, and I will say, Travis definitely deserves the credit there because I was sort of like, oh, look at all these young players getting, you know, teams playing thousands of minutes on youngsters. And then it's like, well, that homegrown player is 27. So <laughs> not quite the same as young 18-year-olds getting experience. Yeah, I guess over the course of a season, thousands mm-hmm. of minutes is not really that much. When you think games, sure are, is not. games are almost 100 minutes. No, right? and then when it's like one team playing, like giving young players 5,000 minutes, and then you look, and I'm, I'm talking about one team in particular, and then it's like, oh, it's their goalkeeper who starts every game, and everybody else got like three minutes. Cool. <laughs> Okay, I guess uh, people will find out who those teams are if they Mm -hmm. listen to the Top Draw Soccer Show. DC United. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right, back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening. Thank you, SeatGeek, for sponsoring today's show. We'll be back this week with um, our quick reviews of MLS playoffs as they happen, um, and also some suggestions to fix US soccer, and also some answers to more listener questions. All right. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again soon.